Beautiful Houses by Frank Lloyd Wright. 1867-1959 Because this is very much about the whole concept of how important it is to have a beautiful home. You've got to put yourself back into the uh, 19th century. Perhaps if you were a multimillionaire then, uh, perhaps there were lesser outlets for you to indulge yourself, i.e. there were no super yachts or jets to buy. So for most people who made a lot of money, the priority was to spend it on their home. Not only would they engage a major architect, but if you made money, the most important thing was to create a beautiful home and to fill it full of the most beautiful objects. In the case of Frank Lloyd Wright, many of those objects would be supplied by him as well, as he believed in the concept of the Gesamtkunst Werk, uh, the home as a total work of art. They borrowed that idea uh, from Wagner, uh, the idea coming from opera, which was to be totally immersive. And the idea was that if you had a beautiful home, you would have beautiful children and possibly, ladies, even a beautiful husband. And because this beautiful home, which was the mission for many women, was to be a civilizing rock of one's life. It was to be one's retreat. It was to be a, an oasis, but it was also to fulfill all your ideals and aspirations. So I've got two images, as you can see here, of Frank Lloyd Wright looking rather dapper. And you can also see up here one of the references to his design ethos, because he is very much uh, shaped by the English arts and crafts movement. And you can see here, I believe a house is more a, a home by being a work of art. So this is how you've got to think of the home. So I wanted to put in some names that you could immediately connect to, that you might be more familiar with, Frank Lloyd Wright was very lucky in that he was commissioned to produce over a thousand projects, 500 of which actually survive. Whereas poor old Charles Reddy Mackintosh, as you know, uh, struggled against uh, a lot of opposition to his own particular house, Beautiful. So the number of projects of his that have survived, you can literally count on the fingers of both hands. But as you can see, he is in the same orbit. In fact, Frank Lloyd Wright lied about his age. He shaved two years off. He always said he was born in 1869, which would have made him exactly the same age as probably England's greatest house architect of the Edwardian period, uh, Sir Edwin Lutyens. So I'm hoping that by giving you these two men, these really famous architects, you can now perhaps position Frank Lloyd Wright more obviously in what was in fact a worldwide phenomena, the idea of the home as a work of art. Uh, Mackintosh, of course, uh, most of his works are in Scotland, but some of you might have been able to visit Derngate, which is in Northampton. One of the reasons that he shaved a couple of years off his age uh, was uh, he was very vain. He was he, he built a mythology around him uh, himself. I mean, it was self-perpetuating uh, right from the very beginning. But I also have a feeling um, his parents' marriage was extremely unhappy. Um, and in fact, there was a very acrimonious divorce. But I have a feeling that he feared that he might have been conceived out of wedlock because his parents married uh, one year before 1866. So I think he might have added a couple of years on uh, to make it sort of very obvious that he wasn't born out of wedlock. And when we come to discover how important his faith was to him, that perhaps might become more apparent. And uh, his faith and his mother are going to be the two defining elements in his life. So I'm starting off here uh, with, as you can see, a playhouse. It's part of a much larger complex, but this is known, all the houses are known by the wealthy people who built them. So Avery Coonley is the name of the owner. But the important thing here is the playhouse. So I'm hoping that you're noticing here, everything is designed by uh, Wright. But what I'm really hoping you can see are the stained glass windows in the background. 
Um, because my reason for choosing to start in a playhouse is that, that Wright's entire design ethos was shaped by being raised in the kindergarten system. His mother was actually very well educated. She uh, basically kept the family going. Uh, the husband was rather a ne'er-do-well, a musician who never got enough work. But she kept the family going through teaching and she was converted to Frobel. So I don't know if you know about the Frobelian system, but children learn through play and they are given a series of shapes, uh, blocks, wooden blocks, spheres, uh, cubes and pyramids. And evidently, Anna, who is his mother, uh, from the outset envisaged that her son would become an architect. So she gave him these blocks to play with from a very early age. And you can see all these blocks, these spheres, circles, uh, the squares and the triangles are going to be the fundamental elements in his uh, language of architecture and interior design. If you're interested in Macintosh, you can find the same shapes, uh, squares, circles and triangles. And they are very meaningful shapes because they are referred to as divine geometry. So squares always represent Earth, four square, four continents, four rivers, four seasons. Circles always represent spirit and soul. Think of um, saints with their halos. And triangles always represent the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And most importantly, represent our aspiration to the highest, not uh, monetary aspirations, but spiritual ones. And then the colours are important. So uh, like Mondrian, who was a theophysist, um, Wright was very sensitive to symbolic colour. Red is always the colour of Christ's passion. Yellow, these are the primaries, obviously. Yellow is heaven, literally. And blue is the colour of the Virgin and of the sky. So when you get to know this vocabulary, you can see that he's going to be playing around with it for the rest of his life. And these shapes and colours were introduced to him through his Frobelian blocks. You can see here, I mean, he has a very distinctive calligraphy, as does Macintosh. But what I'm really drawing your attention to is his little logo down the bottom. So it is a square, a square with a circle in the centre and then the arms of the cross to represent unity. For Wright and for Macintosh, everything in the project was to be unified, every aspect to be integrated. And this is absolutely essential for Frank Lloyd Wright as it is for Macintosh. So I'm just showing you some of the squares that you would have seen when you went around the School of Art in Glasgow, that, sadly, that's the one that burnt down. But these are squares that I have collected around the School of Art, again, emphasising that this geometry was very meaningful to them. So I know it sounds like I've been reading too much Dan Brown or perhaps imbibing too much gin and tonic to suggest that these very simple shapes are very meaningful, but for Macintosh, they were because they were four in the group. They were the Glasgow four. So they took the, uh, the, the square as, in effect, their logo. And when you come to do a Gustav Klimt and the Vienna Secession, you're going to have to get into this idea again of symbolism. The other really important defining uh, culture that influences a right is Japan. He will actually travel to Japan and he will build a very famous a hotel in Tokyo, sadly no longer with us. But he particularly collected prints by Hiroshige and Hokusai. And this is, again, typical of the era. Macintosh collects them as well. They were fascinated by the less is more concept of Japanese art. So I'm showing you here uh, one that Wright actually owned, uh, which is the, it's almost like the Great Wave at Kawagawa, but in fact, it's the Naruto uh, Whirlpool, dates to 1859. And also to make you think about Japanese architecture, because we often hear they haven't got any, uh, in the sense that a lot of their buildings, they're in a, an earthquake belt, belt, remember, a lot of their buildings are quite ephemeral. But what they are is open plan. 
And of course, uh, both Macintosh and Wright are pioneers of what we refer to as breaking the box. Her houses had been lots of little boxes, but both Wright and Macintosh pioneer what now seems to be very obvious to most of us, open plan. So can you see here, there's no walls uh, internally, but you can break down spaces using screens. And both architects will employ that idea, again, when they want a more intimate space. You'll never find a right door in the middle of a wall. He always puts them to one corner. So when you walk into a room, it seems much bigger than it really is. So planning and optical illusion of space was very important to write. And it all comes through his love of Japan. And this is by Macintosh, and it's a kimono cabinet. So I want you again to think about, you know, Wright and Macintosh in the same sort of breadth of their interest in minimalism, and their interest in integrated design, and their love of all things Japanese. They both collected uh, blue and white china. They both collected Japanese prints. And my cabinet here is actually based on a kimono. <clears throat> now, the other uh, element that's really important, and again, emphasizes the idea of unity, is uh, in fact, Wright's faith. This does not obviously apply to Macintosh. Don't think he was particularly religious in the way that Frank Lloyd Wright was. And that's largely, again, because of his mother and how he was raised. We know that when the family broke apart, um, he was in his late teens, and we believe he actually changed his name from Frank Lincoln Wright to Frank Lloyd Wright in honour of his mother, Anna, who was a domineering, remember, element in his life, sometimes to the detriment, particularly when you discover he's going to have very troubled private relationships with his women. But the Frank Lloyd Wright plan comes from Wales, obviously, oh, well, vast and very supportive of Anna as her marriage broke down. But Anna, and I've put a, a square around her so you can identify her, looking rather sternly, as you can see in my image, was a devoted Unitarian. So Unitarianism is, again, something that we tend to underplay. It was really important at the end of the 19th century. It has a slightly different take on conventional Christian belief. A Unitarians do not believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. God is one, hence Unitarianism. So I also don't believe in transubstantiation, as far as I can understand. And they are very humanitarian and very green. They very much believe that God is present in nature. Birmingham and Manchester are dominated by Unitarian families. And they, one of the perhaps the most important thing about Unitarians is that they are very philanthropic. They don't believe in the life hereafter per se, you know, that everything will be okay when you get to the other side. They really do believe that you need to be uh, generous, compassionate, and, and all those aspects that you think of in terms of openness and generosity. They believe that to be part of their life philosophy. So all of this is giving you, I hope, a good idea of Wright's background. The influence of his mother, those kindergarten blocks, the influence of Unitarianism, and this idea that he wanted to create a house which was at one with nature. So the Green Lobby would very much appreciate him today. I'm not going to dwell on his religious buildings. I'm going to very much concentrate on his homes. But, you know, you can't really not show you uh, the wonderful, as you can see, Unity Temple, which he designed in 1905. And can you see here the four squares outside? Uh, uh, wait, no, again, it's this idea that God, well, I should say Christ is every man. That's one of the fundamental ideas of Unitarianism, that Christ is every man. And you can see here again the, the way in even which your calligraphy conforms to this idea of a, a sort of like a design ethos. So Matt, he would have undoubtedly been completely au fait with what was going on in England at the turn of the 19th century. But just to remind you, it was, of course, William Morris that kicks off the whole idea of the house beautiful. 
That's I'm hoping you recognize is Red House, uh, Bexley Heath, completed in 1859. And it's a good example of a home as a work of art. We know that Wright uh, read both a Morris, who writes a lot, and a guy who writes even more is John Ruskin, who, of course, was very much banging the drum, not only for the Gothic revival, but for an architecture that had national roots in the way that Morris wants an English architectural style based on what we refer to as the vernacular, i.e. building in local materials and using local styles. Wright is going to want an American architecture. He wants to break away uh, from what he sees to be inappropriate uh, European styles. So nationalism will play its part. And another arts and craftsman who had a profound influence on him is Charles Robert Ashby, who you see photographed here by Wright in 1910. The year before, Wright had left America to go on a long European tour. And we know that amongst the many people that he met uh, was Robert Ashby. He probably would have also met him, Ashby, I mean, in America, as Ashby had done a lot of campaigning in America, traveling around, lecturing like I do, uh, talking about the efficacy of uh, the House Beautiful, but also about the rights of workers. So he was much more on the socialist side, much closer to William Morris. Uh, now, Standen's architect is, as you know, Philip Webb. But Philip Webb was a very sort of retiring character. So he, by the end of the 19th century, his buildings were not so well known compared to those of the wonderfully named Mackay Hugh Bailey Scott, um, who spent quite a long time on the Isle of Man, uh, where you'll find several of his most important houses. But I'm showing you Blackwell because it's indicative of what an arts and crafts house looks like in England at the end of the 1890s. Blackwell dates, as you can see, to 1898 to 99. So it would have been very influential on Macintosh as well. It's now a museum devoted to the arts and crafts movement, and it's near Bowness, okay, if you want to visit. From the outside, you can see it looks like a rather conventional, overgrown English manor house. It was built for the Holt family, who were brewers. And if I ever come back in a second or third life, I'm going to come back as the wife of a brewer, as they do seem to have not only a lot of money, but also a lot of good taste. So the idea here is to produce a house that is quintessentially English by reinventing vernacular forms, in this case, using the local slate um, as the roofing material. And it is also very grand inside. So we have a huge hallway, which was for entertaining. So this is where you would take your boots off. This was a holiday home. I love that idea, where you would come in from hunting, shooting and fishing, and you would want a place to take your boots off, have a toddy. You might, there, originally there was a billiard table at this end of the room. So it was uh, very much an open plan space, but with a very obvious purpose. It was where the family collected round these giant ingle nook fireplaces. There's one at either end of the room. It looks very traditional, very Elizabethan, or as they like to refer to it at the time, Tudorbethan. A bit of everything again, but immediately gave the aura of a period house. And uh, much more radical was the drawing room where everything was white. Now, don't say to me it's influenced by Macintosh, because remember, this is before Macintosh. Um, but everything here is white because, again, another sort of development coming out of the arts and crafts movement was the whole concept of the white room, uh, light, open, airy, sort of breaking away from that sort of traditional gloom of the Victorian home. So, again, note the beautiful Inglenook fireplace. And Bailey Scott was immensely well known across Europe. Unlike Philip Webb, he exhibited everywhere at all the major exhibitions, Paris 1900, Turin 1902. He was particularly popular in Germany, where he was commissioned to produce several houses. His interiors were very well known through contemporary periodicals. So I'm showing you here an imaginary interior from about 1904, which I think you'll agree is a little heavy 
in terms of its decoration. But the important thing is that everything has been designed by Bailey Scott. And these ideas were obviously transmitted across the Atlantic. So this is a so-called Bradley House, uh, named after the uh, designer, Will Bradley, from the Ladies' Home Journal. And ladies, you would buy these journals. You would see these ideal rooms. Uh, this is the dining room. The dining room, is we're going to discover, is a key element in a right home, as is the fireplace. They are frequently ingle nooks. Again, a bit of coziness in the open plan arrangement. But look all the decorative elements here. You've got a frieze running along the top that appears to be a Vikings. Yes, because, of course, again, America tried to convince itself that that was its origins, not Christopher Columbus. All that early archaeology uh, bringing, you know, the idea of the uh, Vikings from Greenland actually discovering uh, America. The important thing here is, again, that they are trying to create a style which is American, trying to use uh, the vernacular and this English arts and crafts ethos of attention to materials to create something quintessentially American. And this takes off and actually becomes known as the bungalow style. And they have a lot of land in America. I think you've noticed that. So they don't have to worry about um, density of population. So they're much more likely to build sprawling bungalows, rather Indian. I always think of the bungalow. That's its origin. Um, rather than, you know, um, uh, High rises. The high rises come later, obviously, in New York in the 1920s. But at this stage, around 1900, the ideal is the bungalow house. And at the heart of it, as you can see, is the Inglenook fireplace. Husbands have come home from a hard day at work and they are now nestled by the fireplace to read their newspapers. You can see in there. And mother, of course, is there sewing, as mothers should, uh, with her child at her knee. And again, remember that whole idea of if you have a beautiful home, you're likely to have a beautiful husband and even potentially beautiful children. So Frank Lloyd Wright, after having a, a difficult start in life, he did not go to university or anything like that, but he will arrive in Chicago in 1887 to start his career as an architect. In a few slides time, you're going to see his fantastic studio house. Again, I just want to emphasize the importance here of the Inglenook fireplace. No one should be without one. Or all the little inscription that goes over it. Truth is life. Good friends around these hearthstones speak no evil of any creature. So again, you've got to think of the home as a sort of haven in which to retreat. And by 1900, uh, Wright had developed his quintessential prairie house. I mean, some of his best buildings and in, are in and around uh, Chicago. He wanted them to represent the prairie. So again, the bungalow, though they're usually two stories high, as you'll see. But they have these long, low roofs and continuous windows. And the idea is that they have integrated into the landscape. They don't sit in it or they don't sit on it. They sit within it. He always argued, and this is one of the things I approve of, that you don't need a garage because, of course, this is the era of the arrival of the car, even more so in America. But as he said, and I would agree with him, garages are a pain because all you do is fill them full of rubbish. You never actually put a car in them. So much better to use the garage, part of the footprint of your house, and simply have a car port. You could almost say that that was one of his most important legacies, the concept of the carport. So this is the Ward Willits house. So again, it's just to remind you that they will all have the name of the owner. So when he starts out in Chicago as a fledgling architect, he is going to be very much under the influence of uh, Louis Sullivan. You might also almost describe Sullivan as uh, America's Art Nouveau architect, as he is very keen, again, on symbolic decoration. And he is also very keen on the whole idea of organic decoration, as you'll see. 
Sullivan was in charge of a very large firm, Adler and Sullivan. And Wright always describes him as his Liebermeister, meaning the man who shaped his destiny. And perhaps one of the most famous buildings that Wright worked on at this stage in his life as a draftsman, not as an architect, is the Guarantee Building the, in the or Prudential Insurance. So it's the Guarantee Building, but the company is the Prudential in Buffalo, which is New York State. But one of the most important complexes of Wright's houses is in Buffalo. The easiest way to get there is to fly to Toronto, drive down through Niagara Falls, and that brings you to Buffalo. It was Louis Sullivan who came up with the most one of the most famous architectural catchphrases that form must follow function. So things are to be, be are to be both practical, functional, and beautiful. So all of that will be expressed in their architectural forms. They're also very keen on what we now refer to as rational architecture. So you can often work out from the outside of a building what's going on on the inside. But of course, this is one of the early skyscrapers. It's like a giant tree, the decoration coming up to these uh, windows at the top. And the lower element here would have been used for retail. Here's what I mean about the decorative element, which would almost make you think of uh, Louis Sullivan as an Art Nouveau architect in his love of organic form. So these are the initials of the building, Guarantee and Prudential. And the decoration, as you can see, is vaguely Gothic, vaguely Byzantine, but most importantly, really uh, organic in terms of its uh, root, uh, sorry, pollen the pun, its roots in nature. And one of his most famous buildings was the Stock Exchange, again in Chicago. But you can see here in the surviving portal how important the decoration was. So initially, Wright works alongside Sullivan, producing these magnificent urban houses. They have sort of still have a classical feel to them, I feel, with this rather beautiful extended loggia or balcony. And Frank Lloyd Wright was still very much under the influence of his master, Louis Sullivan, but he was already suffering from a lack of funds. So whilst working alongside his master, he was um, moonlighting and producing what we now refer to as his bootleg houses. As you can see, these are much smaller. These are mostly all in Oak Park, where you'll find over 20 houses attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, some of them look rather English, don't they? Uh, with their shingles and their clapboards and their long, uh, low eaves and their sort of twiddly turrets that look a little sort of... Uh, Gothic in style. Unfortunately, Sullivan did not approve of this bootlegging, which is the reason why they're going to part company. However, this is not before Sullivan has enabled uh, Wright to build his own ideal studio house. So he lives here from 1889 to 1909, as you can see, best part of 20 years. And the front of it, again, looks rather Surrey or Sussex style uh, with the these are wooden shingles, the big gable and this rather nice the window. The windows are really important in his um, houses and you know, designed to bring in the maximum amount of light. But this is a rather charming feature, the little sort of arch shape over the top. It, like many, uh, like many houses, as the family expanded, I'll talk about his wife in a minute, but as his family and his practice as an architect expanded, the house got bigger. So this is the uh, side view because we've now had a library added and also a studio and drafting room. As from the outset, once he becomes an independent architect, he is developing a school of architects who will again acquire the epithet, the Prairie School. So a uh, detail here, still a hangover, if you like, uh, from his days with Sullivan. They are designed, these stalks, by Richard Bock. So we have a tree of life. Here's a close-up. A book of knowledge, an architectural scroll, and two stalks, 
who are supposed to represent wisdom and fertility. You can see the book of knowledge, hopefully, but the, the two stalks are very obvious to either side. And it's, in fact, there's a sort of architectural plan here in the center and the tree of life is above. And they run across this, again, loggia or veranda on the front of the building. But this is a good uh, segue through to his marriage uh, because the stork came very often to the Frank Lloyd Wright family. Um, he will have six children uh, with his long suffering wife, uh, Kitty, as she is always referred to, uh, Tobin. She came from a very different background. So whereas Wright, uh, through his um, disadvantaged uh, childhood, had grown up uh, really suffering all of the impact of poverty in terms of living standards and education. Kitty came from a very well-heeled uh, Chicago family. She undoubtedly enabled his introduction to likely clients. But I've always felt very sorry for Kitty because she had to live with his mother. And I have a feeling that living with Anna must have been a strain on any marriage. This, of course, is Frank Lloyd Wright over here in profile. So this is a good example, again, of how he is reinventing houses to be not, you know, there to be machines for living, not like a Bauhaus machine. These are far too humane from that point of view. But he's really sort of rethinking about the function of a home. So this was the playroom for the six children. I rather like that idea. One imagines that they had to cope with lots of frobelian blocks in the playroom, uh, thanks to Anna. But look at the amount of light coming into the interior here and the importance again of the fireplace. Oh, and the top, um, these aren't always skylights. They're often built in light fittings, as we'll see. But there's a very obvious Native American uh, vibe going on in many of his decorative elements. This is actually the story of the fisherman and the genie from the Arabian Nights, but you can see here what I mean about Native American culture creeping into his design ethos. And this was designed for him uh, by Charles uh, Corwin. So again, he'll often work with other, uh, other designers. It's often a collaborative project. So this is the library, like it's an octagon, as you can see. And inside, double height, I wanted to show you his collection of Japanese prints. And in fact, this one here is the one that I showed you earlier, the Naruto Rapids. And this is the drafting room because already he had a team behind him to work on these massive projects that he will take on as his career expands. So this is the drafting room added in 1898, again, double height. So this is going, this is on the left-hand side of the building. By this stage, 1900-ish, um, he has literally evolved an entirely new school, the new school of the Middle West. And these are just a couple of the architects. But honestly, his legacy in terms of the next generations of American architects is huge because he will later go on to found the Taliesin Fellowship. But more of that later. Again, I just want you to notice that even the workspaces are beautifully designed. And the, these workspaces, that's the drafting room, is connected to the house by this wonderful uh, corridor. You can see that lodge here on the outside with the stalks. But again, look at things like top lighting, fan lights or inbuilt electric lights. It's all electric light, by the way. Again, because these houses are both uh, socially advanced and technologically advanced as well. <clears throat> so then we come into the house part. So this is the open plan staircase. He likes these tiny little slats. There's quite a few other English architects who use those. There's still quite a lot of decoration going around. As we go through the houses, you'll see how the decoration is paired away all the time down to the essentials. But then we come, you can just see that ingle nook that we saw earlier. This is the uh, beautiful um, sitting, sitting area sitting room, a lot of built-in furniture, banquettes. Uh, he always has his windows in continuous rows. Light is absolutely essential. And uh, you can see here again how every element is integrated, but also how this, this area flows into the next area. So he's very keen on this idea of breaking down the box 
that had been the traditional Victorian home. So the dining room is top lit. Uh, there, there are blinds down the bottom. He will sometimes give you privacy by frosting your windows. He's very keen on stained glass, as you'll see, but there will be a distinct shortage of curtains. Obviously, he was not keen on those, and he wasn't keen on fitted carpets either. You're more likely to have a tile floor and then beautiful rugs. Again, this is all part of the hygiene that he's thinking about, uh, because, of course, they didn't understand really how many diseases were transmitted. And we have two big killers at the end of the 19th century. TB is one of them, and that struck down everybody, regardless of class. But cholera was still a major problem at the turn of the century. So hygiene would again be part of his ethos. And I'm just comparing his uh, live, uh, dining room here. And dining rooms are really important to Frank Lloyd Wright. The idea is that you must have a big dining table. And then you all get together at the end of the day, you turn off your phones, and you all talk to each other about what you've been doing. And this, of course, is an ethos that has been continued by IKEA, who maintains, again, the most important thing is to have your big IKEA or IKEA uh, dining table. But look how solid it is. It's very much, um, you know, driven by sort of honest, solid construction of the arts and crafts variety. And by comparison, just look at how ephemeral uh, the dining room at the Macintosh house is. But they both favour the tall back chair. The idea in an open plan environment is to have the tall back chair create a screen around the table. So you have a square within a square or a rectangle, I should say, within the shape of the room. And this gives you an element of privacy and again, intimacy when you're dining. So they have a lot in common, as I'm hoping you're getting my message over. <clears throat> now, this is his first house as an independent designer. Uh, by this stage, Sullivan has had enough of his bootlegging and the two have parted company. And uh, built in 1895, it doesn't actually look much like the original house, as unfortunately it was destroyed by fire and then rebuilt in 1923. Again, it's in Oak Park. So we have a sort of before and after. But I do like the comment that you can see um, inscribed down the bottom. A porch on a half-timbered English Tudor that never happened before. So it's a good example, again, of his adapting what we would refer to all the time as vernacular. So there's still some very obvious English elements here in the half-timbering, and particularly in some of the stylization here, the sort of Gothic uh, character of the windows over under this huge overhanging um, second story, sort of jetted out like a medieval house. So that's not really typical, but the important thing is the chronology. It's the first house that he creates independently. But it's not long, as you can see, just a few years before we get into what I call his groove, what will become the prairie house with this long roof and what looks like almost like a pair of spectacles here around the doorway. And very soon, this row of windows here will become continuous. This is almost like, you know, you're seeing his style evolve. You come through that doorway there into, again, a very English style, a hall, um, and the idea, again, of a circulating space. It has an absolutely magnificent Inglenook fireplace. Here it is, uh, which is separated by these very elegant, as you can see, columns, again, giving you that idea of intimacy. So this is very like a Bailey Scott house. And then you come round the back and there's this rather lovely bay window. And that's the stair turret, which you can see is easy to identify. So he's using this idea of rational architecture, being able to work out from the outside of the building what's going on on the inside. And already we have these very distinctive overhangs, which will become a hallmark of his style. Inside, as you can see, there are still elements from Louis Sullivan. These lovely organic capitals look basically Art Nouveau. And here we appear to have an evocative view of the sort of Rhineland 
or Germany, uh, with a rather lovely turreted castle here in the centre. So you can't help thinking that he's still thinking of that idea of an Englishman's home, uh, you know, as a castle, or an American's home as a castle, the legacy of Europe. By the time we get to the Arthur Hurtley house, however, Oak Park also, as remember there's over 20 in this suburb of uh, Chicago. This is 1902. We have now got the more fully evolved prairie house. Same elements all the time, the long, low slung roofs. Uh, the houses are only two stories. He didn't like basements. He thought that they were expensive and essentially again, um, not worth the money that they cost to create a basement. This is typical. Uh, now we've got the windows running all the way round, and he tends to put the best rooms up on the first floor. This is also typical, the big arch, which is protected from the view of the public by that um, sort of little dwarf wall that goes round. It gives you an element of privacy as you enter the house. And the outhouse has this really distinctive um, right feature, the big rather Romanesque looking arch, which he has borrowed from the architect who is often regarded as the founding father of American architecture, Henry Hobson Richardson, who actually came up with a new style known as a Richardsonian Romanesque, what a mouthful, a Richardsonian Romanesque because he reinvented the round arch, as you can see here. A lot of his buildings are in granite, again, gives you a sense of strength. His most famous building is Trinity, the magnificent church in Boston. So he is ironically inventing the Roman, reinventing the Romanesque to make it American. But the important thing is the legacy of the rounded arch, as opposed to the Gothic pointed arch. Though, as you can see, that springs up immediately above our fireplace into these wonderful light fittings. So this is the interior of the Arthur Hurtley house. And I'm hoping that you're noticing that everything is integrated. And this is actually, as you'll see better from this view, half an ingle nook. So he'll now make a sort of bench um, which will often have bookshelves and uh, and you can sort of move it around. So you can have it as an ingle nook, but it's not fixed in place. Very clever development, as you'll see. Oh, and it helps if you can afford to have a few Tiffany lamps around the place as well. A nice idea. And you can see what I mean about his preference for slats. So it's all very solid. It's very sort of English arts and crafts furniture. You sort of really feel it's well made, not like a Macintosh chair that tends to fall apart. And here in the Ward Willits house, which we looked at earlier, um, but I'm showing you the dining room because again, you feel a Viking could pop in for lunch. Don't you? It has a sort of, it, it's solid. These tall back chairs that go round the table, but this magnificent light fitting above and the windows now completely open to either side. So you're in like a glass box all the time. And he, he creates an element of privacy by using a lot of leaded lights. I won't call it stained glass because, of course, it's very much in the Tiffany style. Each house will sometimes be themed uh, to a particular plant that, again, relates to the prairies, uh, like wheat. But in the case of the Dana Thomas house, uh, that's, again, the name of the owner, Springfield, Illinois, 1904. The uh, flower here that we see represented in the stained glass and in the light fittings is the sumac this is again you can see the same motif here the stylized sumac and I was hoping I had a sumac to show you there it is down there so again it's this idea of rounding your house in nature by taking a motif and then following it through all the aspects of the design so he designs pottery and this is the manufacturer Teco and they're huge by the way this vase is almost well it's over three feet so it's a real architectural statement, um, his pottery. Uh, the light fitting is the same. Everything is integrated into this, using this uh, design motif right the way through. So here it is on the outside of the building. Again, this is the uh, stylized sumac uh, flower, if that's the right word, and leaves. So you can see them here. And these tiles are all over the facade. There's my big round arch. The owner of this, um, Dana Thomas uh, Lawrence, or her full name is Susan Lawrence Dana, um, very, very wealthy. 
And so that's her library that she built at the back. So that's the house. Then you went through this covered walkway into the library. And the library was primarily for displaying her Japanese prints. Each table was arranged so that you could contemplate a Japanese print. And uh, you can see they're glazed here in the center of each table. And so you sort of like imagine, you know, you have a special space to sort of bring in your Japanese feng shui moment rather like it. Back in Buffalo, we have this enormous complex created uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright, known as the Darwin Martin Complex. So for many years, this was derelict. Um, it was given over to vagrants. It was basically destroyed. And many people felt that it was likely to be demolished. But then, of course, a group of enthusiasts came along, founded a trust, and the restoration work began in the 1990s. Um, it was built uh, for the Darwin Martin family, but the money comes like port sunlight from Larkin Soap. And they had their company, of course, um, in downtown Buffalo. We have the Martin House, the George Barton House, which was for Martin's sister and brother-in-law. Originally, there was a carriage house, a conservatory, a pavilion and a gardener's cottage. So it's more like a colony uh, than a series of houses. And uh, the conservatory is long gone, but that's now being replaced by this building here, which inevitably is an interpretation centre. I want to take you around this in some detail. This is my sort of key home to give you a really good idea of what Frank Lloyd Wright is about. So again, we enter through a porch that is very clearly concealed. You go in through there. Um, and the big overhang, which again has now become his signature. You enter through these fantastic double doors with their uh, glass, uh, leaded glass doors. Again, the theme here, all the themes are taken from plants. Takes you into the um, open plan uh, interior. I, I couldn't resist putting in these. Look what's on the wall, Japanese prints. So again, it's just to remind you, you know, that it's always there in the background. So we're looking here at the dining area, but the whole dining area flows into a sitting area. And then eventually really what you would describe as a sort of music room, as there's the piano in the background. So here's the plan. So you came in through that wonderful concealed entrance, the porch, with its double doors. There's a huge fireplace just here, which is really a divider. You've got a library at one end, a dining room at the other, and then the reception room is set here at the back, a little bit more, uh, you know, um, cosy, if I can use that word. It's not really that cosy, but you, more private, I think that would be a better description. And the kitchen is actually located for once, quite close to the dining room. Thank God for that, your food's not cold. As we go through it, you'll see how all those spaces, however, flow from one to the other. So here's the reception room. It's got the inevitable round-shaped arched fireplace. All the furniture, of course, by Frank Lloyd Wright. His famous uh, tub chair that you see here. This is this big dividing fireplace. And the wisteria is the theme on the fireplace, which is entirely ceramic and was one of the last elements to be uh, reinstated with this huge restoration project. Uh, the living room area is really as much for music and entertainment, but can you see how all the walls here are made out of glass? And that's emphasized even more here when you're looking beyond to these covered loggias. So you will know he's breaking down outside, inside, because all of these doors, uh, the whole wall moves. You can push it aside during the summer and then the air flows through the entire house. So these are in fact Giant conservatory doors, I think, would be the best way to describe them. And the same is true, too, of the sort of the veranda door. And then it's got the lighting above it here. So you've got light coming in from all directions. Again, beautifully restored with its leaded lights. That's that, just that little corner. Now you're really full of envy, aren't you? And thinking, how the hell can I get that into my house? But obviously, it does help if you're a multimillionaire. So you can see how that becomes a feature. This is the Mayer May House, which is Grand Rapids, 1908. But the same elements, I don't need to reiterate them. It's all about top lighting, side lighting. This is the house from the outside, the concealed porch, the huge overhangs, the whole sort of feel to it being rather Japanese. And this is the interior. The, the This is the 
sort of Inglenook fireplace. But I wanted you to note things like the attention to detail. Again, the rather um, Native American style of much of the textile decoration or the elements within the textiles. Um, I particularly like this house uh, because I like the idea of this particular dining table. So he's moved on now to a dining table where you actually build in the foliage. So the idea was that you had these little white bowls here. They're light fittings, obviously, they're all electric. At least I believe they're electric, though having thought about that more clearly, I think they might well have been candles. God, that don't burn the house down. But here you can see that the little white bowls are supposed to be filled full of foliage. So you'd have one of these on the corners of your dining table. And the dining table, again, with these really tall back chairs making an enclosed space within the open space. He doesn't like walls, so he takes the corners down all the time. So even if you don't, uh, you can't open plan completely, you can knock the corners out. So it's just that one um, element that separates the dining room from the entrance hall. And then on this side, that moves straight into the living area. And this idea of open plan it comes to fruition in the so-called Roby House, which is now part of the campus of the University of Chicago. So there's my table again with its light fittings at each corner and its little white bowls, which he designed to put the foliage in. You can see what I mean about these chairs becoming screens. Everything in this dining room is designed by Wright, but it's all fully integrated. You have a buffet here. This is the back of the fireplace. And this is just one immense continuous space within the house. This is the most Japanese of all of his homes, probably his masterpiece, as you can see, completed in 1910, the Roby House. So this is the other side of the uh, fireplace. Uh, the theme here is ears of wheat in the leaded glass, the light fittings, everything you're look at, looking at is designed by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. One of the key motifs is a tree of light, a tree of life emblem. And this is this projection here under this huge overhang, which is now very much one of his um, sort of like um, key ingredients, the big overhang. So ears of wheat, uh, trees of life, and there's the big fireplace, sort of slightly sunken, but if you wanted to, and the whole, this is just one big open space, and all these windows fold back. So in the summer, as you know, it's very hot in Chicago, you could literally open up the walls to either side. So it's the most dramatic in terms of this breaking down of the outside and the inside. And if you wanted to, you could put a banquette against the fireplace to make that distinctive ingle nook shape. And I just want you to compare this to uh, Macintosh's masterpiece, Hill House. There's a delicacy, isn't there, to Macintosh? A femininity, which of course is brought in by his very talented wife, Margaret MacDonald Macintosh. But they too are thinking about the way in which spaces are used. So Hill House has a very distinctive drawing room. It has this winter area here, round the fireplace. Then it has a, a space for the grand piano, uh, like, of course, the way that Wright had designed a, a space for the piano at the Darwin Martin House. And of course, this is the open area, the, almost like a conservatory, which is particularly, I think, beautiful because of the addition probably of Margaret's designs for the upholstery and curtains. So I'm just trying again to emphasize how in tune Macintosh and Frank Lloyd Wright would have been in terms of their design ethos. But then Frank Lloyd Wright goes on a sort of personal crisis, a sort of total um, breakdown in terms of his, um, uh, his personality, or I should say his sort of where he has a midlife crisis. He doesn't quite know where he's going to go next. I suppose he felt that he'd exhausted the prairie house. He certainly thinks he's exhausted his marriage uh, because he abandons his wife, Kitty, and those six children. And in the local press, he is referred to as Frank Lloyd Wrong. To make matters worse, he runs off with another man's wife. A mama, as she's known, Borthwick Cheney, who was actually the wife of one of his clients to make it even worse. 
And having run off together, Wright uh, will escape to Europe. This is when he travels around Europe and meets people like uh, Charles Robert Ashby. And he builds a love nest, uh, Taliesin, which means literally shining brow, uh, which was to be a love nest for his new woman and her children. But uh, we have two basic problems. Well, one of them is very big. One of them is that Kitty will not give him a divorce. And the other is in 1914, one of the employees at Taliesin goes completely bonkers and with an axe uh, kills Mama Cheney and her two children and various other servants on the estate and then sets fire to it, basically destroying it. He Wright was Wright was not there at the time. He was off uh, building the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo between 1913 and 1922. And he only learns about the fate of his lover um, after the events. So here, as you can see, the headlines, the terrible fate of Mama Borthwick in her bungalow of love. That's the bungalow of love, a Taliesin, which, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright will rebuild. Women who wish Frank Lloyd Wright dared live uh, contrary to accepted rules of conduct meets disaster in a few short years. Many, I think, probably felt is she had her just desserts, if you were pious, obviously. And this is what he was off doing. He was off reinventing himself um, in Japan. And this was, of course, his uh, sort of all comes together, his interest in Japan, Japanese prints and in the building of this amazing hotel, which sadly is no longer with us. But in this reinvention, he moves to California, and he'll now launch what is often referred to as Californian Modern. The most famous house of this group created in and around LA is the Aileen Barnsdale House, affectionately known as the Hollyhock House, 1916 to 1921. It was to be almost an, a sort of not quite a hippie commune, but certainly an artistic commune. And his design ethos has now changed. You can about see that already. He's using a lot of concrete, concrete that is pre-poured and basically will almost be like a textile in terms of its a sort of textual feel. So a complete change in his design ethos, a reinvention, buildings that you might even refer to as Art Deco. So this is why it's called the Hollyhock House. This is the motif that we can trace all the way through. They're frequently expressed as pinnacles along the roof line. We think that some of the influence for, for all of this change is moving away from the English arts and crafts movement, but to something else that was a quintessentially Mesoamerican, Mayan architecture. So this is Mayan architecture, with all this surface decoration. And this is the amazing Mayan or Mayan theater in downtown LA, which dates to about 1930. You can see it here, this is the um, entrance, and this is the patterning on the building, which is now a cinema but it was originally a theatre. And uh, back at the Hollyhock House, again, this was the open plan for court. You know, it's like an enclosed, it's almost like an Italian Renaissance house with this enclosed um, piazza in the centre because this was going to be where they did all of their exercising. So it was very much a sort of um, a new way of life. So it was a scene, it's much more of a statement about a new way of life than just a house and it was going to be a dance studio so I can imagine them practicing their pilates in this enclosed court and inside it's really beautiful it looks out over LA as you can probably gather from some of my images but some of the decoration again has a very obvious Native American vibe going on though there's still plenty of Japanese screens in the background at the dining room even the chairs have taken on the form of hollyhock I'm not too sure about the light fitting. And as you can see, the dining room is quite cozy and dark. And again, this is a long standing idea that your dining room should have a sort of slightly more darker, intimate feel to it. But we're moving on now to the Ennis House, which perhaps gives you a better idea of where these houses are. You're very close to the Hollywood sign, looking out over downtown LA. And the Ennis House is incredibly famous. It is made out of concrete blocks. 
but they all have this texture to them. Again, the idea being to be evocative of those Mayan temples. Look at that view out over LA. And this is it from the outside. It's been in Blade Runner. It's been in Westworld. You name it, it's been in a film. If you want a futuristic house, the Ennis Brown house is the one to go for. I've actually photographed it here from the Hollyhock house. You can see it across the valley. Here's a close-up of one of the textured panels. And it looks almost like a fabric, doesn't it? When all these textured panels made out of poured concrete um, are, are all put together. So a completely different ethos known as Californian Art Deco or Californian Modern. There's still lovely touches like fireplaces with mosaics and the columns inside again are all made out of this textured concrete. Um, open plan, though remember you're right up on the hill overlooking LA, but there is the balcony overlooking that fabulous view. And by this stage, he's got a son who has joined, as it were, in the family enterprise. So he is inevitably Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., but he's always known as Lloyd Wright to differentiate himself. And he is the architect of the Soden House or um, Soden House, which again is in this Mayan style and has a wonderful history to it. Because again, it's been associated with things like the, um, the detective fiction of the era. So it's the Black Dahlia that was filmed here. I love the pool in the center. Have a few too many gins and you're likely to fall in that. But this is the exterior and we're looking through uh, to that space on, from the other side with the pool running down the middle of the house. So it really is not practical, but visually very effective. And just as we're coming towards the end, but his love life gets even more entangled. So, of course, Mama Cheney is, I'm afraid, no more. So in 1922, Kitty eventually gives him a divorce. By that stage, she's got involved with a woman named Miriam Knoll. She starts to write to him after the death of Mama Cheney. They're sort of commiserating with each other. They are both, in effect, widows. When Kitty eventually divorces him, he will marry Miriam Knoll, uh, but it's a terrible mistake. Um, it, they have a very destructive relationship and he will divorce her in 1927 when he meets Olga Varner, who is a dancer and obviously from the name, as you can see, has an exotic background. Uh, they will marry in 1928. He moves on quickly, as you can see. And they will have one daughter, Iovana. But sadly, his stepdaughter, I tell you, his life was um, not a happy one. As you can see, many tragedies do uh, dogged him. Um, but his stepdaughter, who was Svetlana, will unfortunately die um, in a car crash. So his life was not without its personal problems. He might have been an American icon, um, but his uh, personal story had its ups and downs. And one of those big downs was the Depression. So he has again to reinvent himself. Nobody wants those Californian Art Deco or Californian modernist houses once we hit the early 1930s. But now he's influenced by the English Garden, uh, Garden City movement. He's read about Welling Garden City and he's read about Letchworth. And he thinks these are jolly good ideas. So he comes up with the concept of the Broad Acre City in 1932. This is to be utopian, as the name suggests. Everybody is to be given an acre to build a beautiful house, but also to be able to work the land. He argues there's plenty of it, allegedly, in America. And so this idea of urban sprawl, which we now frown upon, was at this moment in time seemed to be a good idea. However, ironically, now post-COVID, we're all going back to it. We all want our little plot of land in the countryside. So the broad acre city might come back. He develops a type of housing that is prefabricated. It's known as the Usonian house, as in USA Onian. Again, quintessentially American. This is a pre-order, so it's standardized. And it's also uh, partly pre-constructed. So you could like Lego, order your kit, Frank Lloyd Wright house, and then build it. A couple of these have actually been preserved. So that's the sort of like uh, perspective for your black pack. I like that idea. Frank Lloyd Wright house. 
And here's one that's actually been uh, preserved. So this is from 1935 to 37. And uh, again, he argues for no basements and no garages. You only need a carport. And with the aid of his supporters, he creates what is known as the Taliesin Foundation. This is not Taliesin East, but Taliesin West, which in Scottsdale, Arizona. And this is where he's going to train another generation of architects. So this is the drafting room here. I'm looking at the drafting room. And this is it from the inside. So he's a very important mentor and teacher for another generation who are going to really take off in the 1950s. And so we come to perhaps his most famous house, the one that is often described as the most important architectural project ever created in America, Falling Water of 1934 to 37. You know, he's now nearing 70. Makes us feel very, I think, good about ourselves to think that you can create your masterpiece at the end of his life. It's also the Kaufman House because that's the family for whom it was commissioned. Um, it is totally integrated into the landscape. It might have been using new technology like the cantilevered overhangs, which have created architectural problems as they are concrete. But Frank Lloyd Wright said he wanted the family to live in the river or over the river. So falling water does what it says, literally falls through the house. You can compare it to Corbusier's uh, famous house uh, at Poissy. This is the so-called Villa Savoy. And you can see the enormous difference between the modernists and Frank Lloyd Wright. One looks like it's landed from outer space. And the other looks like it's literally been built into the landscape, has become part of it. And again, the attention to detail is very important. He wanted it to represent the Kaufman's uh, lifestyle. So these rocks that you see here, there's a better view of them coming up, was where the Kaufman's had sat to go fishing in the river. And he integrated them into the house in front of the fireplace. And this was a little indoor um, fireplace come barbecue where you could roast your marshmallows and everything. You swing it over the fire. I love this idea. A lot of the furniture, again, are built in. So I wanted to emphasize very much that Frank Lloyd Wright's drive was very much uh, through the, the ideal of a perfect house and home. I could have equally spent the last hour talking about his public buildings, his churches, the famous Johnson Wax Factory, which is now again preserved, or the high point for many of his career, uh, the Guggenheim, of course, museum in New York. It was originally designed between 1943 and 1959, and um, is, of course, backed by the famous uh, Solomon Guggenheim family. I'm sure you've heard of the Guggenheim in Bilbao and the one in Venice as well. So it's finished in 1959, literally the year that he died. It's like a giant ice cream cone at one end. And this is looking down because if you've ever been to visit the Guggenheim, you know that really as a museum art gallery space, it doesn't function well at all. Um, because these walls are at an angle and it's very difficult to hang a painting on a wall that's at an angle. Um, but of course, it wasn't really designed for that. This was to be an open plan promenade that moved you from one floor to another. And you can perhaps see that most spectacularly here looking down the staircase. But my story of Frank Lloyd Wright really ends with falling water a sort of exemplary house. Uh, that is now the epitome of this idea of on, uh, an organic nature, of breaking down the walls, but most importantly, creating an architecture that is quintessentially American. And if we just go back to it and we look here at the Corbusier one of uh, the Villa um, Savoy at Poissy, when all of the Bauhaus decamped to America, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is not friendly with them. He really hates the likes of, of Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe arriving in Chicago and in Harvard because he sees them bringing back 
um, European architectural forms. And above all else, what Frank Lloyd Wright wants is a quintessentially American architecture. And for me, falling water really sums that up in the way that it expresses the American dream more than anything else. Thank you very much.